Hey everyone, thank you for joining us here at uh, MSP Power Hour. Uh, I'm Pete Kazanji, your host today, and I'm super pumped to have with us Mr. Mike Marg, uh, an investor at uh, at Craft Ventures. But, but that's a recent thing, right? And don't hold it against them because he's actually a sales leader in disguise. I'm really excited to have Mike here to, to chop it up with. We're going to let folks trickle in here for a hot second. Um, but but Mike, what's um, what's new? What's good? Any big plans this weekend? You and the fam been traveling recently? I think you're your wife is due soon. What's what's yeah. happening? So we're having a baby at the end of this month. So we're just like getting the nursery ready and like doing everything that I will not want to or be able to do a month from now. So just a lot of home stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, not, not a lot of traveling going on anyway, but um, yes, definitely get the go bag dialed in first yeah that's the first thing to to make sure that you have such that like and then and then things that can be dealt with later you can you know have have dealt with later um I'm, i've well, got like a full like cooler ready and like we got like apparently like all the hospitals are like locked down for covid so like you can't leave like you can check out but you can't leave so i'm <laughs> I'm preparing accordingly. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's like uh, Hotel California exactly. Hospital Edition. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, wonderful. Okay, killer. Well, um, so hey everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, so, so while we're waiting, um, I'd love to give everyone a few moments to kind of get familiar with the Zoom webinar interface. We're really excited about you participating in this. So use the chat panel, use the Q and A panel. Um, et cetera, because like what we want to do here is we want to answer questions that kind of come up throughout the conversation. This, we're really here to provide you guys a resource to answer questions that might be like a pain in your ass right now because you've got a really illustrious uh, sales le leader turned, um, you know, who's gone over to the dark side in the form of Mike here. And you've got me who kind of like hangs out and, you know, kind of knows a couple things based on my experience with MSP and what have you. Um, go ahead and drop in the chat room where you're, where you're kind of joining from, what city you're in, et cetera. Um, and, and then we'll go ahead and get started here. So for those who aren't familiar, Power Hour is hosted by Modern Sales Pros. Uh, so MSP is the world's largest revenue leadership community for people in sales management, sales and revenue operations, sales development, and related related supporting disciplines. And so our community's mission is pretty simple. It's to create an environment for our 30,000 members to answer questions that they'd struggle to solve on their own and then help them see around corners that they may not know about. And so the way that we do that is through great sessions like exactly what you're going to see today. Um, through our online robust forum and in the near future in-person uh, event, events. And so for folks who are previously not uh, members of MSP, we'll go ahead and add you to that, uh, to the community. And if you, you know, if you don't, um, if you don't get added, go ahead and drop us a note at modernsaleshq.com. Uh, and so, you know, before we get started, just kind of a few reminders here. Power Hour is a unique format. There's not really a specific piece of content that we're going to be talking through. Rather, we're going to be um, picking the brain of our revenue leadership guest here, in this case, Mike, uh, and then answering your questions. So please do use the Q&A panel. Um, you know, you can use the, the comments, et cetera. And then moreover, if you have um, anybody in your, you know, in your organization you'd like to join, just like flip them the Zoom link and they can come in and, and join us here. So um, with that, let's go ahead and uh, do some introductions here. I'll make mine really quick. I'm Pete Kazanji. I'm the founder of MSP. I'm also the co-founder co and CRO of, uh, of Atrium. Atrium makes data-driven sales management software that helps uh, AE, SDR, and AMCSM managers use uh, data and metrics to improve rep performance. Uh, and then, and but more importantly, Mike, I would love for you to introduce your introduce yourself, what you're working on right now, and kind of maybe your last couple of roles. Yeah, you're right. I see myself more as a seller than I see myself as a, a VC <laughs> or an investor. Um, but I've worked at companies like Dropbox, Slack, and Clearbit in a bunch of different sales and sales leadership and even sales enablement roles. I've kind of seen every corner of the sales org and then joined Craft about a year and a half ago, investing in bottom-up SaaS. I focus a lot on go-to-market SaaS. I love APIs. I think Clearbit opened my eyes to how uh, interesting those types of products can be. 
And uh, I, I'm really go to market focused as an investor. I think I care a lot about like, who's your persona and how do you sell your deals and how does, how's your org going to scale? That's kind of the lens that I invest in, which I think is a helpful one. Yeah. The actual mechanics of like, Hey, cool. Nice narrative, bro. What's the actual, uh, what's the actual brass tax right. uh, there? How, how big was the Clearbit sales organization when you were there? It started very small. I, when I joined, it was probably uh, eight to 10 people. Um, and then now it's probably like 30 to 40 to 50 people. Um, but it, we had like just a couple teams, like, like maybe two or three SDRs at the time. Um, and then maybe like when I joined like two AEs and then we hired quickly, like got to five AEs and then pretty quickly got to 10. And now there are probably 20, 25 AEs at, at Clearbit. Yeah. And then when you joined Dropbox, how big was the sales organization? Did you join as a seller or as a sales manager? I, can't I joined remember. as a seller. Um, so I was actually the first person hired that was like purely focused on outbound selling. So I had actually never sold before. They were looking for like people who had done like finance jobs. They were like, let's just find a bunch of like non-obvious smart people who want to get into tech, make them sales people and like see what happens. And that actually ended up being a better approach than it sounds like it sounds ridiculous but like at the time just there weren't as many like SaaS companies like there just wasn't a big pool of talent so I think it ended up being a smart thing for them to be like let's just get people into our cool office and like make them want to do whatever job we have to be done and like we'll go from there and that's basically what I did. Nice. Got it. And then, um, wonderful. So, so again, folks, please, uh, you know, please drop whatever questions you might have for, for Mike here. Obviously he, he led the Clearbit sales organization up to 20 sellers. And then actually how big was the, the Dropbox sales organization when you went over to Slack? Uh, when I went over to Slack, it had to be 200, 300 people. Like it, it was a yeah, big just, global just a, just, org. Just a couple, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like Mike knows a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton about like bottoms up SaaS, you know, sales assist motions, MarTech motions in the, in the form of Clearbit, right? Um, IT motions in the form of, of Dropbox. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of experience around, around bottoms up and kind of sales assist motions there. So if you have questions around that, God bless, please share. Um, we have stuff that has been kind of like dropped ahead of time um, here. So we'll kind of pop into that, but like, please, uh, please do note your questions in the chat or in the Q&A panel, we can get into that. Um, so I think you you obviously interact with a lot of sales organizations, especially now as you know as an investor who sits on boards and kind of hear report outs from your, um, you know, from your partners, uh, uh, portfolios and, and what have you. What, like, what do you think is kind of like the secret sauce be behind the highest performing sales teams that you see at, at kind of growing companies? I think the secret sauce, this may sound trite, but the first place that my mind goes is the product has to be killer. Like you just have some sort of a killer product that finds product market fit. And then it's just like, there's such an organic pull from the market to buy the product. And then it's just a matter of like, how do we structure an org so that we don't fumble the opportunity. So I, I think like that's the common secret sauce. And I kind of know that because I've been in a lot of like, I've had a lot of quarters that felt like it was a clusterfuck and it, it ended up being fine because like there was just so much demand from customers that you kind of can't mess it up. And sorry for swearing, I'll try to watch my language. That's okay. The, the audience appreciates that. I mean, we're all like, you know, we're all, we're all like filthy sell sellers here. Right. Um, I'm surprised we're not having like beers at, uh, at 11 AM in the morning. Um, yeah, totally. I think there's an interesting thing there. It's kind of like, it's contingent on like the timing of the organization. So like, I mean, and this is really top of mind right now for, for me at Atrium, um, because like there's, there's the initial point where you're trying to find product market fit, you're selling those initial deals. And actually I have a deck on this. I'm going to just drop into the chat room here, but like this notion of like, Hey, you've got that early on where you're like a single seller or like a handful of sellers or what have you. And then once it's that actually is making sense, this is a really hard thing for founders and also early sales leaders to do is to like get themselves out of the business of selling or even like directly managing reps and you'd be like, whoa, not directly managing reps. Cause then what you have to do 
is move on to building the machine yeah. that then manufactures more reps. Yeah. And so like, that's a little bit of a mind fuck. Oh, see Mike, you got me doing it too. <laughs> um, that like, that's, that's problematic because, and actually, um, uh, uh, an eight, uh, one of our vendors is a company called security pal. They automate the, the completion of, of security questionnaires. And like, kind of, they're in this situation right now where like, they're like setting the world on fire because like we're customers of theirs and like, Oh my God, you'd have to like, that you'd have to drag it from my cold dead hands um but like they they have these amazing win rates and and like amazing commercial density because like the pain point is like so 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 substantial and so their sales leader right now is like struggling to get out of the business of like helping the reps manage the deals and what have you because like he's got his eye on the number as opposed to like no man like that that is rolling downhill like yeah. that 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 snowball's rolling downhill you got to go over here and pull more talent out of the market and then build the system that then onboards those folks and like, you know, packs them onto the side of the snowball rolling downhill. And that can be like a really big, like, uh, like change of mindset for folks. I know that you have a really good blog post on it that I'm going to share with folks here around like how to do a good job of like methodical onboarding and kind of like building that, I call it a self-driving, um, onboarding process so like that that can just be like a really big kind of like you know mindset change there um what and i think we actually had an interesting question here um andrew had an had a question here around like what are some key pieces to the puzzle that get you an aha moment um around i i presume that this is related to um, the, or like a company that you're looking at or or i guess maybe in the in the sales motion itself yeah, Andrew, I'd love to clarify because you could be you could be alluding to the key pieces of like a sales motion puzzle or the key pieces of a evaluation of a company puzzle. So feel free to drop in the chat if if I'm going the wrong direction. I interpreted I interpreted key pieces of the puzzle, give you the aha moment as uh, like just uh, yeah, looking at a sale from the outside and going, oh, this is like a killer sales, but I mean, I, I think basically like big deals, if you can sell big deals and you don't have a huge competitor in your space, like that's immediately very interesting. Um, and I think like the lens of what I want to sell this product is a really good lens to invest in. And mm -hmm. the products that I would want to sell, I'd be saying to myself, okay, there's a world where I could sell this for, you know, six figures. Like I could sell like pretty big deals where I show this to a customer and they're like, holy shit, there's nothing like this. Like, this is amazing. Let's talk more. And you're not competing with like Microsoft or these huge giants in the space. Like security right. path fits all those uh, attributes. Like there, there's someone that I tell my personal friends, like, hey, you should join this company because like you can crush your quota. And uh, it's a really compelling product that like no big player is going to try to uh, tackle this. Yeah, and I think that that this is something that we think about quite a bit at Atrium, right? And uh, like this is both a sales behavior, and it's also like a product management behavior as well. And I guess it kind of in between, it's like a product marketing behavior. Insofar as it's like, how can you rapidly manufacture that? Like, oh man, oh man, yeah. now I now I need this moment, and um and. And so it's, it is fascinating because obviously we talk about like PLG stuff and bottoms of SaaS and whatever. And usually that, that, oh man, oh man moment is for like an individual contributor. The problem with that is that it's oftentimes like a pretty thin use case. Like it's, oh man, oh man, this is rad for me because I'm an AE and I use Scratchpad and it's now it's so much better than like waiting for Salesforce to load. And now like my notes are being appended onto my ops and and so on and so forth. But obviously like those initial deals are smaller, right? Or at least those initial transactions or like yeah. Fig Figma is a great example. Like Figma is a big Atrium customer. I know there's a bunch of Dropbox folks over there as well, but like the unit, the initial unit of value is small, but it's like, whoa, rad. And then, and then there's an interesting thing. It's like, okay, well, if you, can you get a bigger lump of value, but still have a rapid aha situation? So like, you know, security pal is a great example of that where you're know, like, yeah, we'll just automate a, you know, security questionnaire for your like atrium is a good example of that where 
our AEs are just purely, purely, purely lined up around helping people turn on atrium accounts because what ends up happening is they do a little disco, they like reveal the fact that like the organization really doesn't have much in the way of like metrics driven management or data driven sales management for for whatever reason, right? And it's like, oh, well, like if you turn on atrium, we'll be able to see show you immediately how those reps are ramping. Or like, oh yeah, you're worried about your pipeline hygiene situation. We'll be able to immediately show you which of your reps are like the dirtiest of the pig pens or whatever and like uh, allow you to very quickly and and so that can kind of happen through product behavior like in our case we're going to build a lot of product um and it kind of took a long took a hot second to kind of get there like multiple years in order to get to that very quick aha moment that represented you know a a pretty substantial lump of value for like a manager or a sales operations person but I think that that's something that people can think about is how can I quickly get to this? Oh man, now I got to have this moment and yeah. then potentially do it for like larger lumps of larger lumps of value. Yeah. Um, how, have you seen kind of ways that organizations have done a better job in like getting to that aha moment without four larger lumps of value, but without like the requisite um, like engineering expense to be like full PLG. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. I guess one thing that I was thinking while, while you were kind of, uh, you know, driving to that point is ROI. Like I think about ROI a lot. And I think that's one of the things I also really like as an investor looking for is like envisioning what kind of ROI can you pitch to a decision maker? That's one of the cool things about Atrium is like, There is, I'm just putting myself in the shoes of your sellers and going like, hey, sales leader, uh, VP of sales, like right now you have no visibility into what's happening in your org. Like, isn't your entire job having that visibility? Like, doesn't that scare you a little bit? Like, do you have, do you have any idea how to diagnose uh, like whose activities are falling below a certain threshold or who's ramping and who's not? Like, so ROI is hugely important. And then it's interesting to, to back up product like Figma is, you know, huge Tam, anyone can use Figma. And so they can, they can charge a little bit less. And, and they also, it also lends itself to a PLG like bottom up motion because like, yeah, just, I mean, sign up. I don't care if you pay us zero, we'll figure out a way to sell you the enterprise plan later, but we need you using the product for that to work. And so I, I think it's like an interesting, like the aha moment is different based on who you're how big your TAM is. If you yeah. have a massive TAM, every single company in the world has designers. You can you can have a different motion than if you're selling to B2B sales orgs. Like yeah. you can be hugely successful, but it's just that the aha moment's a little bit different. The aha moment for a smaller TAM, I think comes from a seller and comes from me going outbound potentially and going, yeah. hey, here's a challenge that you specifically are, are facing. And with PLG, it's more the aha moment comes from your users are like, they've reached this aha moment. And now to the decision maker, let's standardize. So anyway, yeah, that, yeah. that kind of took a few turns, but it starts with ROI. And I think it just looks very different based on your, your motion. Well, I think um, it's funny about the ROI thing. There's, there's like ROI, um, like from a you know, metrical standpoint. And then there's like ROI from like an emotional standpoint, which is kind of like what you were delineating there around like, hey, Mr. or Ms. Sales Leader, like, I'm pretty sure that your board has an expectation that you are managing your business by metric and that like you are enabling your managers to do so. And if you're not, yeah, that that like clench. And so like, that's more emotional, right? And then, um, and then I think that there's, you know, one of the things that I tell my sellers to do is to do like the left brain, right brain, you know, disco and also kind of like ROI where it's like, oh, you could be very logical about it. Like a good example of this is, um, you know, when you turn on an atrium account, we actually pull down all the historical information as well. So you can kind of go back and look at like reps who have maybe like, you know, actually departed the organization or like maybe are in seat right now are kind of like a little like on the bubble. And you can kind of go back and be like, oh yeah, you can see that like that actually started like four months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Wouldn't, it wouldn't have been nice if, and of course that's like a little bit more kind of like left brain, et cetera. Like, hey, cool. If like we could improve that person's performance, how many more of these people are going to have these problems in the future? Yes. And then you can do like the emotional component of it. Like I, I think a good example of this, there's a company called um, Sonar 
that um, you know they're an Atrium customer. Right? They're also a craft portfolio company, and um, you know they do really cool stuff. Where like you know they they do um, change management and like instrumentation of your revenue stack. So like all of your Salesforce workflow rules and your flows, and, and like I think they also support Pardot, and I can't remember if they support Marketo yet. But the whole idea is is like. I mean, we all know this is like a lot of us end up kind of being like deputized Salesforce uh, admins is you go in and you like you do all this like administration, like automations or whatever. And it's like totally opaque. Right. And so what Sonar does is like they jump in there and they like analyze uh, all that and then like essentially show you where either you or like other people in your organization have like laid landmines. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> in your auto. So, the, but think about the aha moment of their sales motion, which is like, yeah, let's go ahead and like turn on sonar to like interrogate your Salesforce, Salesforce account. It's like, cool. Here's all the things that are currently broken right now. Yeah. Right. And then moreover, have you ever had a time where you changed something and it broke something really important? Like, I don't know, the demo request flow, right? And the person's like, uh, yeah, cool. Well, wouldn't it be helpful? If, it, if something like yelled at you yeah. <laughs> before you did that. And like, so you could do like the ROI version of that. Like, oh, what's the cost of a lost demo, et cetera. Then there's also just the like, man, you'll be in a lot of trouble, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> if that happens. There's a, there's a couple of things that this brings to mind. One is like, I've, I feel like I've done so many discovery calls in my career mm -hmm. that you start like, it's easy to sort of go like, okay, if I were doing a discovery call around Atrium or Sonar, how emotional, you're right, it is all emotional. ROI, it starts with emotion and maybe you can justify with metrics, but like it really lives in the emotion of it. And I'm, I'm trying, as an investor, especially you're like, okay, if I'm selling this product, how emotional is the, the buyer persona over this? And I think Sonar is a great example. That's and interesting. Ops, ops professional gets very emotional over like, oh my God, like I've, <clears throat> I've nuked my sales force and that was the worst. And if you're telling me I can avoid nuking it, oh, like that thing. Yeah. And, and by the way, contrast this to my experience at Dropbox, which I think is an iconic company, but there's no emotion based sure. on the product that we sold at the time. I, it, has, it has evolved since then, but at the time sure. you're going to an IT leader and going, Hey, you have a bunch of usage. You want to like centralize it. There's not a lot of emotion there. You're not solving a business problem. So yeah. that's, that's how I kind of contrast it. And, and I lovingly pick on Dropbox because I, I love <laughs> it so much, but like, you know, the, the, the key is you have to build enterprise features that the decision maker is going to get emotional over. And it yep. took Dropbox a little bit to do that. Box took that approach from the beginning. Um, but ju just to kind of contrast, like there's emotional sales and there's ones that aren't. And if you're not as emotional, you need some sort of a different angle. Man, I think that's a really good point because at the end of the day, in order to sell 25K deals, 50K deals, 100K deals, there's still a budgetary decision maker, unless it's like an API and it just like sneaks up on you, like a segment or a snowflake or whatever. But even then, like, you're not going to get to like 10 K or like 25 K of spend on, on a credit card. Like there's going to be someone who's like involved in like in signing off on, on the budgetary decision. And so if you can show them something around either a, this is how you're going to get promoted or B how this is going to help you help prevent you from getting fired. Um, I think that's a really compelling thing. And now that you're making me kind of think about that, I think we do that somewhat in our in our discovery conversations where our AEs are talking to like SDR managers or AE managers or what have you around like, what are your hopes and dreams, right? Like, well, you know, wouldn't you like to be able to manage, you know, manage by metric and be data driven without having to rely on sales operations, right? Like, you know, doesn't that, be, wouldn't that be a great superpower to have? And wouldn't you like to like, maybe not feel like the the weak sister there as compared to the, the people who can do all that reporting or what have you. And then moreover, don't you want to be a VP when you grow up? Because like, guess what's required there? Um, a really great example of this is um, there's a guy named John McMahon who, um, you know, he was the one of the fathers of MedPIC, and he was a sales leader at um, at PTC, so Parametric Technology Corporations. He's on the board at Snowflake. He wrote a book called The Qualified Sales Leader that I just dropped into the chat. And there's a really good section on uh, discovery in there where he recounts a, a story of him getting cold call by an insurance salesman, a life insurance salesman, who like through very provocative question, um, like you know, interrogation, kind of like Socratic method 
leads John to realize what a problem it would be if he like died with while and before his his kids had gone to college. So I really, really heavily recommend it because it's a great example of selling a completely commodity product yeah. in the form of insurance, like life insurance. And the guy just like nails him through through discovery in a very, very compelling way. And I think like applying that to your own motion can um can be really powerful. Yeah. Um, when, when I'm thinking about discovery, like what I want to do is create like a 3D like hologram that I can see in my mind's eye of like how this org operates. <laughs> and I'm not really trying to like convince you or sell you. I just like want to understand the state of the world as it relates to my product. And if I can get a good enough hologram, it's pretty easy to sell based on that hologram. And, and like for, for Atrium, you know, the question would be like, just, it would be like, tell me about this current process. Like, how do yeah. you manage your sales team? How do you like, tell me about, um, how do you see the, and visualize their metrics? How do you identify problems before they happen? And I think very quickly you'll get to like, uh, we kind of don't, it's tough. Like yep. it's, we use Salesforce dash. It's hard. Okay. Well, and, and then, and then that gives you the opening to dig deeper and deeper and deeper and, and just clarify. Like so much of my discovery is like just clarifying so that that hologram gets more high fidelity. Yeah. And then you can kind of like sell based on where there's weaknesses in the state of the world. So, oh, so not to press on that analogy too hard, but like, that is kind of how I think about it. Totally. And I think what, what, and, and um, Andrew had a really good um, uh, question here about multi-stakeholder selling, which I think is, um, and um, which I think is really, really important. Cause like a lot, especially in a larger sales motion, like you're going to have more stakeholders, right? Um, and and I think that hologram um, is a good example because it's like one under one thing to like understand the hologram of an individual sales rep using Scratchpad, right? Or um, or an individual operations person whose life might be made easier by using Sonar, or an individual AE whose life might be made easier you know, through having the security questionnaires that come in at the end of the quarter, like automated from by security pal. But I think then understanding the rest of the organization and the other humans that that's kind of where things are a little bit like spicier. And I think, so the way that I would kind of address that to Andrew's question there is like, I think one having like really crisp comprehensions of who the personas are, like I'll use our personas as an example. We call them the, an the animals in the zoo. Who are the animals that you're going to meet in the, in the zoo? It's going to be an AE man. It's going to be a, a manager. So either an AE manager or an SDR manager. That's like one. The next thing is going to be like the person who's responsible for helping them with like analytics and metrics. Probably it's usually a sales operations person. Then the next person is going to be a sales leader, right? Well, how are they different? Well, they're actually not managing directly, you know, AE. So they, they don't have, they have different pain points around, oh, I need to understand what this rep's metrics are right now. They're more concerned about, okay, here are my five managers. I got my two SDR managers, I got my three AE managers. And like, I'm, I can't be down in the dirt with like with their reps. I have to worry about enabling them. And then there's like sales enabled. So like having those crisply understood. And then what you have to do is where things get even more complicated is understand how that might change on an organizational persona level because there's human personas and then there's organizational personas, right? So the size of an organization will change the behaviors of some of these men or at least their, their current state. And so this is why you can get really complicated in a hurry. So essentially you've got like, you know, organizational personas here and then you've got a human personas here. So in our case, like you've got three by three so that's nine cases, yeah. right? And so now imagine, this is why like multi-product sales can be like such a, so much brain damage. Cause like now you've got three by three and now you got to go back, like say you're three products, like Clearbit's a good example of this, this right? Clearbit, exactly. Yeah, super cool products, right? Like Clearbit Reveal, Clearbit X Forms or whatever it was called or, or what have you. It gets very complicated. And so like you would like to reduce that complexity. Yeah. Early on in a startup's, organ in a startup's life, it'll usually be more reduced. But to Andrew's point, what you want to do is just be very crisp around that. So then the SD or the AE is like, cool, man use us as an example, we call like a, we, we split our, our clients on tiers based on sales operations count. So like tier one, no sales ops, tier two, 
single sales operations person, tier three, you know, two through 10 sales operations. Like, oh, cool. This is a tier three account with the sales manager. They're probably going to be in this scenario right here. We train this in pre-call planning. They're like, all right, I know what's going to go on here. And so like, they're going to be less, less surprised. I know what the state is going to be. So having that declared first and then, and then moreover, oh, okay, cool. Like I'm talking to the AE manager first and then probably we're going to, he's going to need to bring in the sales operations leader. And then they're going to probably have this perspective. So at least having that declared first and trained on can be yeah. a very compelling way of, of helping your sellers like do better once they start interacting with other people in the organization. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think about it like you could do, if you airdrop me right now into Atrium Sales Org, having never sold the product or not learned about it, like my discovery I think would be okay but it yep. would be a lot of like uninformed questions. It would be like questions that I should probably know more about before I ask them, but like it, it, it could, you could paper over it if you're tactical enough. But the, the reason that you have personas is it's a shortcut of like pattern matching. It's like, okay, I don't even need to, I don't need to ask you as a sales ops person what your goals are, cause I know what your goals are. And the question can evolve from what are your goals, which is like kind of uninformed and I'm not doing my homework to, a lot of sales ops professionals are focused on A, B, C, and D. Is that accurate here? You could change it to like a yes, no. And then that allows you to more quickly go like, yeah, that's exactly what we care about. And here's what else. And then you you gain trust by basing the question on something that they're like, yeah, this, he's making a good read right now, as opposed to, hey, what yeah. do you care about? You know? I and mean, this is the thing that like reps really struggle with. And this is, um, I'm, this kind of goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier about like a self-driving onboarding and, and so on and so forth, because like the reps oftentimes are afraid to have a like deeper, richer discovery conversation. And instead they just kind of like go down what essentially is like a lead form. Yeah. Yeah. How many AEs do you have in your organization? How many, like how many sales operations do people have? I don't know, man. Why didn't you do Why didn't you look on LinkedIn and pre-call planning? What right. the hell? Right. And so like, so, and, and so if you can get folks trained to the point where they've gone through enough of those game simulations, we're like, cool. So I was on your website earlier. It looks like you sell a MarTech solution that's an email sending platform to these large, I saw Pepsi and Coca-Cola and like, you know, whatever on that. These seem like large organizations that would use this. This feels like a high ASP sale. Yeah. Am I thinking about that correctly? Oh yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, oftentimes in, you know, high ASP sales like this, I imagine you have outside sellers, um, you know, you have outside sellers probably like struggle to have visibility into the, their activities. And then moreover, oftentimes there's an expectation that those folks are doing a lot of prospecting because like breaking into those high level decision makers can kind of be challenging for an SDR to do. And, and, and like, am I on the right path here? Am I off? Oh yeah, totally. Right. Um, they are supposed to prospect X, Y, Z. Uh, awesome. Oftentimes we find that um, those enterprise reps, they're not so stoked on, uh, on prospecting, are they? No, they're not. Well, how do you yeah. measure whether, like, how do you measure how they're doing that or not? Exactly. And now you oh, just- we Oh, we don't. <laughs> that level of questioning allows you to cover so much ground because like you kind of want to be careful when you're sending someone off into a five minute answer. Like it's really good in the right oh, you place. Want, yeah, you want but to like, it, it, narrow them. Exactly. You don't want to ask like, like again, in my example of, I don't know the persona and I'm like, so what do you care about? Okay. That's now five to 10 minutes of the discovery call. That well, actually I like, really like the Niners. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> exactly. So it's like by asking yes, no questions until you're ready for the open-ended, you can sort of like establish, 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 and then send you into pain territory, ideally. Um, yep. So yeah, I, I think good questions and understanding your personas allow you to do that really effectively. Yeah. So the way that we, the way that we do this um, I, here at Atrium is one, we have like a bajillion. So like, first we have those personas. Great. Right. Then what we have is we have a bunch of calls, like exemplary calls from chorus in a document where again, it's like that here are the personas, here's the organization personas. Like these are all disco calls. So it's like a tier one, you know, tier one disco calls with SDR managers and it's like three calls and a, you know, a tier two organization with SDR manager. So like that matrix is all filled on. There's like three or four calls each. And then we do the next thing with like, not just the disco call, but instead like a demo. Cause like one of the things with Atrium is we actually turn on an Atrium account and then we, we do what we call a product tour where we have 
the the prospect actually driving through their their atrium instance now of course it's tied to disco like oh you said that you had 10 aes that were ramping right now we're going to go and we're going to look at how those guys are ramping in your atrium instance but then we have those product tours and so what and so like that's literally what our aes i have a class of four aes that are ramping right now they're going through those disco calls and then what i have them do is i have them score them so i've i have um uh worksheets uh and and so what they do is they listen to their call and it's like cool what pain points were identified and they like you know they note that down and what it's doing is mike and i both grew up playing baseball um one of the my favorite things in in baseball practice was game simulation yeah. right where it's like hey, okay cool like you know first and third uh first and third this is the count what's the situation yeah right? Like you're a third baseman, you're, you're a shortstop, you're a right fielder. What's probably going to happen there. And then the coach goes and hits it wherever he or she is going to hit it. And then, and then like things play. And then what you do is you do enough of those game simulations, like cool second and third, what's the situation. Okay. Person's on third. Oh, it's a bunt. What were you supposed to do? Right. And yeah. so like prep, prep ahead of time. And so that way the, the, a, the seller is walking into that call kind of be like, all right, I think I know what's probably going to go down here and I can guide things in the right direction to walk people into those, those pain things where they're like, God, Mike, you're right. I really should turn on an atrium account or like, oh man, that is really scary. I should set up sonar to see if there's any automations that are currently broken right now. I'm glad that you revealed that to me. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, another thing that's made me think of is I think that the best AEs are really good at qualifying people out. And like the, the, the key of qualifying people out is you have to know the product so well and know your persona so well and, and be such a good pattern matcher that you could like ask a couple questions and be like, okay, I know immediately you're just not going to be a good fit. That's also really useful. You save a lot of time, but if, if you're wrong, it, it's bad. You know, if you're like, if you think you're good at qualifying out, but you're not actually good at qualifying out. You're just, you're just throwing you're just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Exactly. Yeah, not le less desirable. I'm sure marketing is really stoked on that. Man, this guy just like closed loss everything right. that shows up. Super exactly. picky. That's the funny. That's the funny pull between a seller who, like, a good seller knows, like, look, like, I know that you worked really hard to get me this lead, but sorry, it's not good. Like, there's nothing I could do with this. I know it. It's hard for me to even explain why it's a bad lead, but I just like know <laughs> it when I see it. Um, but again, it's hard because you better be right. You better be accurate if you're making those call out decisions. But like, that's what good AEs can do is like, I can ask you three <laughs> questions and, and as efficiently as possible, either be like, you're called out or like, actually you've hung in there where a lot of people die in the atmosphere. And like, let's, yep. okay, now that I sort of understand there's something here now, where can I take you to like, get to pain and get to impact ideally? Yeah. One of the things that's challenging there, this is like, <sighs> This is a tough thing with bottoms up and PLG because what can happen is you, you can demonstrate value, right? You can reveal pain and demonstrate value and then, and then potentially like will a transaction into existence. But if you like showed up and did like bant qualification on somebody, in that situation, you're like, like imagine we're selling sonar, right? We're like, hey, so when's the last time you like totally broke an automation and everyone wanted to choke you? Oh, I heard like two, two weeks ago. Okay, cool. So what sort of budget do you have in place right now for um, software that monitors your, uh, your revenue stack automations? What are you talking about? That category doesn't exist. I don't have any budget for that. What? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to call you out. That'd be terrible, right? It'd be like right. stupid. And so I think the, especially when you're dealing with like new categories and, and organizations like who will, un, will be unlikely to have an initiative in place, it, like, like, yeah, it's, it's tough. Like what's the read option there with the yeah. AE who's like, okay, I'm going to keep it versus like, okay, no, you're going to keep it and you're going to get plowed by the linebacker. Like how, like yeah. what's the way to deal with that? I think, so you bring up a good point that you never call out based on <clears throat> pure budget. It's like you call out if like they can't get benefit from the product. That's the way, that's the reason that sure. you call someone out. If you're like, you just aren't equipped to use this product or like sure. there's absolutely, I've asked every single way I know how and there's zero pain. 
but, and again, this happened a lot at Dropbox and it just- or perception me, Or like perception of pain, right? Yeah, ex exactly. This And this this was something that I saw at Dropbox a lot and I'll explain why. And I also saw this at Slack a lot, believe it or not. But the huh. reason is these are freemium, you know, bottom-up products, right? A lot of the pain can be solved by the free product. It's like, hey, do you have, do you have challenges communicating? And No, we use Slack. <laughs> yeah, we use Slack. We love it. It's great. Like, okay, cool. Well, now I have to find pain around- free versus paid so the the yeah. only pains there are hey man does it suck that you can't connect this to sso and they're like not really it's totally not fine. really everyone did fact, it yeah <laughs> right, don't bring it into this i'd really appreciate it if we could just keep using this product the way that we like using it so that, that's another interesting point is like is it, a, is it a pain in your ass that you can't go back and and like search for your historical stuff not really kind of don't yeah. care about it right yeah it only yeah. affects us beyond ten thousand messages and that's fine so like I guess the message here is if you run a PLG company, like product really needs to talk to sales and under, and give sales levers to like exert, yeah. uh, not, I mean, power is the wrong word, but you need some sort of like- There's gotta be a value offset, right? Like there's yes. gotta be something there. Like, I mean, this is the biggest, like segment, segment had this as well, like the longest time, like their biggest competitor was the free account. And this is what happened, I think to your point about like product and engineering, got to talk to sales and, you know, maybe there's a little product marketing in there, kind of like doing marriage counseling at the same time in order to say like, hey, how can we package this better in yeah. order to create a, a compelling situation yes. around this? And so like the long, for the longest time, segment was really, really, really reticent to, um, to do event capping. Which makes sense because like you want to get like you want to send lots of events in a segment over into Snowflake or Redshift or whatever. And so one of the things that eventually they figured out was like having the big the the big delta be um, frequency of syncs. So rather than going from like you can only sync once once a day from segment to Redshift or Snowflake to like doing that every hour. That was a very, very, very powerful lever yeah. because if you only were like using segment to send data over into Snowflake and then like you use Looker to like look at whatever and it was like cool, like the frequency of data update like refresh doesn't really matter versus like, no, 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 no. Like we need this to happen quickly because it's going to drop people out of certain audiences and we don't want people to be getting maturation emails that are like not pertinent to them anymore. Well, like those are very valuable use cases yeah. and a seller could be like, cool. So like, help me, you know, walk me through how you drop people out of audiences, yeah. right? Or like make sure that you're not spending on Facebook or Instagram when you don't need to be doing that. How do you do that right now? Oh, well, like, we, we do it every like, you know, every couple of days or whatever. Oh, okay. Well, what would be the benefit of like being able to do that? Like recurringly, yeah. what well, would be really rad in these, like along these factors. Okay. Wonderful. That's why you need to pay us $15,000 as opposed to free. Yeah, exactly. I think the thing that like these types of companies maybe don't fully understand, it's usually coming from their founders, I think, or like yeah. people at the top who are usually more eng focused and aren't as sales focused. Like, Bottom up is a lead gen mechanism. Yeah, Full stop. Your that's it. That's all it is. Yeah. Like it, it's not anything more than get someone to engage with you in a way that you don't have to pay for. And yeah. it, it, it requires a nuanced discussion of like, what features can we afford to give away for free? But also how do we hold back enough that sales isn't totally toothless? Because if you have a toothless sales team that like they're not holding back any features that people desperately want or need or like yep. management or security or whatever it is. Like you are setting them up for failure. And guess yep. what? Like the goal of your company is not to create a product that like hangs around and is used for free forever. Cause that's just a terrible business. Like you have to view yep. it as a funnel where you're, you're educating people about the power of your product. Like that's the favor you're doing with free is you're reducing the friction for them to understand what you do. And then yep. you just got to put in barriers at a place that makes sense to sell. You know, you got to sell. Yeah. The um, if only there was a book on helping founders understand that. Um, the uh, the <laughs> yeah. I, I I think that the, the that is definitely a big uh, a big area of friction. I think it is getting a lot better in that regard. I think another way you can do it though, and I think you were we we were talking about this in the craft um, go to market mm -hmm. leader. Um, roundup the other day or round table was around like the delta between like a freemium behavior versus like a bounded trial behavior. Yeah. Right. And so 
um, one of the ways that you can kind of like obviate a lot of this, now you lose the lead gen component of it. And I, I like your point there. It's one of the things I like to say is like, never mistake your lead gen for your business. Yeah. And one of the things you can do there, and I actually like the data dogs of the world do this. Um, there's others as well. But you just do like a bounded trial where it's like, 20 days or 30 days or whatever, maybe it's sales assisted, maybe it's not sales assisted where you get them like full God access or what have you. And then, yeah, maybe it constrains back down to some sort of free version of it, or maybe it just goes away, right? Um, that's one way that you can kind of like skin that cat by like not having to contend with, oh, what is the set of features that is gonna be in the paid versus the free, et cetera, et cetera. Because like, that's a more nuanced thing versus like, okay, cool, it's just like 30 days you have the full Monty and then after that, like, cool, we're done or not. Yeah. And I think, you know, Datadog has been very successful in doing, um, in doing behaviors like that. Um, I wonder what other, you know, example, and actually I think that you have a, a blog post on how to run really good proof of proof of concepts and like trials, right? Yes. Let me share the link right now. But the, the yeah. TLDR is like, first of all, I, I really like the trial motion. I think it works really well when you need some handholding, like yeah. Dropbox or Slack, when you just like sign up and get started, like there's no real value to a trial. Sonar where it's like, okay, we got to set some stuff up and like make sure that you actually are finding everything and setting everything up. Trial makes sense because you're increasing the amount of value that they get from the product dramatically with human intervention. So, yeah. and then the other thing is like, there's just a lot of sales orgs where trials are kind of on the bubble like maybe you use them sometimes they're harder than it's worth but like yeah there's times when it makes sense to, to prove the value i'm just a big yeah. proponent of like being extremely careful what you give to someone and like require trades for everything like hey me granting you a free trial or poc is a is a favor i'm doing essentially it's going to require resources you're getting advanced tiers of the product so it's being very clear ahead of time before you give those things or agree to those things. Here's what I need in return. I need, we need to be prepared to make a decision. Like if we're just going to trial and you're not going to be ready to buy for six months, let's simply wait until month five to start the trial, right? Like yeah. I need to make sure you're like actually in a buying window. I need to make sure I have, I'm talking to someone who can actually make the purchase. Is that you? Or like, do we need to loop in someone else? Like there's just- I'm happy to start the trial if- yeah, the, we can get to the economic, get to an economic buyer, et cetera. Right. Exactly. This is like what Sandler calls tennis ball chasing. And like, instead of just seeing every ask as like, oh, I assume this is moving my deal forward. It's going, I need to calculate what this, what I get in return for this as uh, that sounds bad. And I feel bad saying that, but like, that's just good sales is you want a trial? Okay, let me understand why. Let me understand what you want to prove in this trial. How do you how do you want to measure it? Like it's it's getting very like I'm really controlling this process and withholding things that they want if I'm not getting something of equal value in return. And the things I want are commitment to a timeline. I want to understand how you're evaluating. I want to understand who's evaluating. I and again, the hologram analogy holds true. I want to picture how this decision gets made over the the course of the trial period. Yeah, I think the that that holds true as long or actually how um, how like spicy you have to be as a seller <clears throat> in that regard is correlated to the actual like resource cost of the trial. And then one of the things that you can do is you can seek to have processes within your organization that reduce that cost, either yeah. techni technical things, right? Which, which of course is like, you know, PLG or like product assisted. <laughs> Maybe we need PLG and then PAG, product assisted, product assisted gross, PAS, yeah. product assisted sale. Um, where you can say, hey, let's like use, use us as an example. Um, <laughs> so literally our, um, our, the stage and our and our our op stage for when an organization has turned on an atrium account and um, we're set and it's like it's like being like the data syncing and and kind of being set up for them. Um, <laughs> the name of that stage is Salesforce implementation brain damage, uh -huh. and the reason why was because I made that stage five years ago 
when literally it took me like a day to yeah. set up somebody's atrium instance. Now it takes 15 minutes. Yeah. So like from a user facing standpoint, it takes like 90 seconds. They're just like bing, 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 bing. And like they go through this like onboarding flow. And on the back end, there's just like a bunch of automated data checks and a bunch of other, a bunch of other jazz. But then the funny thing is so whereas before it was like a whole thing, right? And so we're like, okay, what like can we talk about a timeline? Is there an initiative? Who's going to be the economic buyer, et cetera? Whereas now what our AEs can do is they're like, cool, we have pain. Yeah, let's look, check it out. Let's check yeah. it out. Come on, let's go look at your rampers. Like, let's go look at pipe hygiene. Oh, well, yeah, let's look at like your SDR activity levels. Now, what then happens, like this is, we didn't like make this up. I just like steal like mercilessly from folks like Datadog or New Relic or like PagerDuty and all these guys. We're like, you do that. And then now, what like you've got that 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 period or whatever in case of Datadog it was like yo it's thirty days and then like I mean I'm happy and then I'm assisting you and I've like obviously I'm hoping to, I'm getting you embedded and like showing you value and and so on and so forth oh cool you want to extend that I need to talk to the economic buyer yep oh you want to extend that well cool that's fine here like I'd like to talk to another product team in your organization. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool, you want to extend that? So in this case, like the trial is live. So it's not a like gating on the trial. It's like extension of it. But now that trades there. And the reason why, of course, is because like Datadog and New Relic and those guys architected their product to be very low cost to turn something on, right? But then, and then what they're doing is just like constraining the, the like the, 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 the free value in order to get things that are valuable to the, to the sales rep. Yeah, I mean, so I, I realize one caveat I should make is the level of spiciness. First of all, I never try to be spicy. There's like spiciness in my head that I translate into, you know, <laughs> hey, th there's a reason for this and let's all get along type of thing. But the level <laughs> of spiciness can change. If, if someone's asking me for a trial and it's not part of our motion, that's more of an ask. If we're Sonar and we're like, hey, start a free trial on our website, you definitely have less room to be spicy or demanding. And what yeah. I would, what I would shift instead is just qualify, like, are you ready to start this like today? Or should we start the 30 day clock? Like when you're ready and it's good because if they're like, no, I'm ready to start today. You're getting agreement. Like, okay. So it's fair that 30 days starts today. You're ready. Okay. Let's talk about how this happens versus if you just assume, Hey, they signed up trial starts and like, you didn't have any sort of like agreement ahead of time. And they're like, dude, what, what the hell? Like it's 15 days in, like I, I've been busy. It's just, you're, you're yeah. going to have like misalignment. I, and I think a, a thing to kind of think about there, this, this related to your aha moment is if you can do something, I think we talked about this in the craft uh, go to market leader round table. If, if you can get something that is valuable <clears throat> for your organization, like a good example of this would be um, before having that like brass tax conversation that then has like persistent value, that can be very, like that can be good. So as an example there, use, use Sonar, right? If you can say, hey, cool, let's turn this on and see like what's broken within your organization. And we'll like, we won't even talk about a trial or whatever, because then if we then have that meeting and we go through all the things that are broken or whatever, and then we're like, okay, cool. Would you like to buy this? Well, I'm not yeah. sure if I like, like, yes, I would. Okay, great. Let's do, let's talk about that. Oh, okay. I'm not so sure yet. Okay. Why not? Like objection, no objection at all. Oh, well, you know, I'd like to trial it in some sort of capacity to see how frequently these breakages happen. Okay. Wonderful. Do you want to do that? So do you want to do that now? Or do you want to do that? Do you want to do that later? Because yeah. then if they're like, oh, I want to do that later, then it's like, wonderful. We're just going to put this on ice, right? We're going to flip the switch on a sonar instance to like freeze it. You don't, you can't have access. And then we'll reconvene in 15 days or 30 days or whatever. But what's cool about that though, is like now sonar has a set up sonar account for I don't know, Atrium, like we're a Sonar customer, right? Like they have a, they have a, a setup account for Atrium. And so when they come back around again, that rep can be like, oh, hey, Pete. Yeah. Um, getting back into contact here. Um, Sonar interestingly noted this many breakages. 
yeah. in the prior 30 days. Are we ready to have that conversation? Because yes. like now you got this asset. Whereas if you had if you had like block that up here, like, okay, are you ready to start a trial? Well, I'm not sure I'm ready to start a trial. Oh, well, like, you know, let's not then let's not turn on a sonar account. Well, like now yeah. you as a seller don't have that ammunition 30 days later, right? Yes. And it's also just good discovery. Like if I'm showing up to your trial, <laughs> you signed up for a trial, we have call number one. It's totally fine for me to be like, hey, here's how like the most successful trials typically run. Like usually you'd be ready to make a decision within the next 30 days. Fine, that's a given. But like also um, we want to have like like weekly check-ins. We want to have someone who can like set this up. Do you have all these things? Are all these things true? If, if one of your conditions for trial success is not true, you should know that as a seller because it goes into your forecasting. It goes into how you problem solve. It goes into who else you pull in. So I think like explaining how a successful trial works and trying to be like, are all these elements in place? You'll figure out the ones where it's like, yeah, everything sounds like it's in place. Great. And we have mutual buy-in. But then you may get someone who's like, yeah, we're actually, we're not going to be ready to buy it in 30 days. And also I'm not the decision maker and also this and that. And it's like, cool, well, guess what I'm working on right after this call? Like I'm coordinating <laughs> it. So all these things that I just discovered are going to provide friction. Well, I, yeah. It's my job to problem solve now. Yeah. Exactly. And, I, and I think mapping, so the way that we do this at Atrium is like, we have a discovery conversation, you know, see, generally speaking, like everybody always has pains because like, 95% of sales organizations like have, you know, a, a lot of friction and kind of like shortfall with respect to, you know, data-driven visibility on their reps and what have you. We seek to light up an Atrium account. We then have that product tour meeting with, with that stakeholder who had the discovery up here, like to the pain points here and then tie them together. And so then there's like a champion test behavior there. It's like, does this, does this fit with this? Does it solve this, et cetera? Yeah, I'm not so sure, blah, 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 blah. I mean, that's pretty infrequent, but like, okay, objection handled, contend with that, whatever. Whoa, I'm super juiced. This is amazing. I'm so pumped. I've never been able to see this before. You know, my sales ops team is going to be so happy that I'm like out of their hair and like bugging them for all these different things. They're like, oh man, my, my managers are going to be so happy that like, you know, I enable them like this and they don't have to come begging to me, blah, 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 blah. Awesome let's get another 30 minutes on the calendar and you and I are going to have a mutual plan discussion yeah. where we go through exactly what we were just talking. So like one, putting that time in place, like let's put time on the calendar to do that. And like the, the metaphor I use for that is you're now on my side of the table. Yes. Like we are homies. Right. <laughs> and then we're going to go throughout your organization. So like one, have the time to do that. And then the second thing that I think a lot of people don't have in place is what are those other, like, I mean, they're just essentially like stage exit criteria, right? But the, like have that checklist of what is needed, et cetera, but like actually declared in a checklist. And so the mechanism yeah. that we use for this is we're starting to use mutual planning software. Um, it's funny, you call it like, it's called mutual plan software. There's like, we use Accord. There's a bunch of others as well. That, you know, there's a company called Recap that makes, um, that makes really cool mutual plan software as well. And um and so I think the funny thing about it is like, even though it's it, like you think of it as a mutual plan software where it's like, hey, we're going to share this workspace. It also is just kind of like guided selling yeah, to the, to the rep. Like, oh, it's my recipe. Like, oh, okay, cool. Because like, you don't have that on the stage. And certainly like, I mean, doing that in the CRM is like, ugh. So, so now you're kind of like, oh, okay, we're here. Yes. And here's the section on that. Do I have these things that are in place? And like, I need to talk through these things on that mutual plan meeting yeah. with the champion who was super juiced. So like providing that recipe to the reps such that they can't let, they're not, not just like casting around trying to make yeah. it up is, is really helpful. Yeah. The, the biggest, one of the big aha moments in my sales career was learning and, and then like really believing that most people you're talking to don't actually know how to buy. They don't know like how that, to buy. Was a, that was a huge breakthrough for me. You just really? see like, you know, yeah. you just see them like fail. Yeah. It's like, you don't know where they're going to stumble, but you know that it's coming. The th oh, totally. oh, I didn't, re I didn't realize that this required more budget or I didn't realize that everyone's going to be out on Christmas. So it, it forces you to take all this accountability for the process as the seller. And, and something like a court is a way to put all this on paper to go, I'm going to show you all the ways that this process fails. Um, th these are our steps. Cause if these steps don't happen, the process is going to fail. And so yeah. just more visibility around like, if all these things don't happen, you're not buying this successfully. So like, let me help you, yeah. let me help give you the recipe to avoid 
failing at getting this purchased? It is absolutely like I think there's two things that kind of jump out there. One is um, one of our uh, one of our senior reps here, a gentleman named Sean Cardenas, who's fantastic. Um, you know, he has this great question, um, great qualification question, because you should always be qualifying even outside of discovery for that meeting, which is like, hey, walk me through how you most recently purchased software at blah, blah, blah. If the like, answer is no, then you know you're, you got to yeah. talk to someone else, right? Right. Like walk me through, right? Yeah. Walk me through. Well, I, do, 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 do. I don't know. Yeah. Right. It's just like, okay, cool. Like at least we know. So that's the first thing. And I think the second thing that um, is really pertinent that you brought up there is that like we as sellers, people think about sellers as like selling something. And, and one of the, I think, and they have all sorts of preconceptions, you know, like used car salesmen and like silly stuff like that. And so the, I find that some metaphors that can be really helpful there to help people understand how they should be viewing their role is like, one, from a discovery standpoint, are you a consultant that happens to have a predilection to a, for a specific product, yeah. right? So you're consulting with them. And then the second thing is that people don't necessarily think about, sorry, my uh, D the light died here. Um, is an an external project manager. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Literally. exactly. Just like an external like cat herder. That's and like, if you, you think about that, like, yeah, because people don't realize, they're like, well, they should know how to buy. It's like, what are you talking about? 26 year old SDR manager. Like, yeah. No, they don't know how to do that, right? Come on, like, like help them. And then it's almost a valuable thing. Like I'm going to show you, actually, we we do, you're probably familiar with Richard Harris. We, we have him do trainings for, um, our customers on just like good management. It's not even like atrium stuff. And like part of it is so that is the SDR management thing is like how um like how to be a good SDR manager is like how to get budget for your tools. Yeah. Same with on the AE side yeah. as well. So like if you as a seller can like, hey, I'm gonna help you do this, not just for my own benefit, this is gonna be good for you from a professional development standpoint. Great. Yeah, totally. Totally. I know uh yeah. I know we're at I don't know. Yeah, we're, I got time, by the way. But no, I, we uh, got we we got to wrap because people got to bounce. But um, but um, this was super rad, Mike. I I I hope you had a, f a fantastic time. I certainly did. I but I'm it. sure that everybody. Yeah, it's like super fun. It's just like geeking out. We should do it with beers, um, geeking out on sales stuff. Um, hopefully everybody else was was super pumped on it as as well. Um, next Friday we have another really fantastic sales leader who's taking a vacation at a venture fund, kind of like Mike, uh, his gentleman named Travis Bryant. He used to be the, the VP of sales at, um, at, at Optimizely, and then he was the head of sales at Front. Um, and so he's going to, he was at Salesforce for, oh, God, God knows, like 10 years or whatever. He's absolutely fantastic. Um, so please come join us next week with, uh, with Travis there. And then Mike, have a great weekend. I really appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have you back on again in like a quarter or so, okay? Thanks, Pete. Yeah, you'll hear some uh, crying baby noise in the background, but I'll, I'll be excited awesome. for that. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Okay, later. See ya.